Oh, good morning, friends. It is good to be with you in worship today. Oh, I got to tell you, not one of those songs that we sang was new to me. But yet today, for the first time, the words, he's a prison shaken savior, just hit me. Today, we're going to hear a story. And it's not about prison, but we are going to hear a story today in our Bible reading about a Savior that not only can He shake prisons, but He can shake us, and He can change hearts, and He can change lives. And Wow. So, worship team, thank you for those amazing songs and amazing music. I'm, I'm excited for what we're going to wrap up today with. But let's come together and pray, shall we? God, we have all come in here with different things in our hearts and our minds, different things happening in our lives. Some of us are, are, are mourning and hurting, and, and some of us are, are confused and struggling, and, and some are filled to overflowing with joy, and then some of us are just maintaining. But you are the God of us all. And you meet us right where we are, right in this moment. And so God, accept our sacrifice of praise and worship of you this morning. In this time of worship, in this time spent here with Crosswind Community Church, make us more like your son Jesus through the power of your word and through the work of your Holy Spirit within us. That's our prayer. Change our hearts and change our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, this morning, we are moving uh, to our Bible reading. And um, Josh, I'm going to hope you've got the slides back there, brother, because the back back screen's down, so I'm going to ignore it. So... Uh, but our Bible reading for this morning comes from John chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 43 through 54. And, and this brings us to the story of Jesus healing the son of a government official. Uh, some of your Bibles might title him a noblesman, but he was a, uh, a government man. Uh, he came to Jesus. He needed healing for his son. And the interesting thing is this story, this event, takes place in Cana of Galilee, the very same town where, for us, just a, just a week or two ago, Jesus performed his first miracle, his first sign, by turning the water into wine. But since that time, Jesus has been traveling a little bit. He went down and, and visited in, in Jerusalem for a while, and, and while he was there, you may remember he met with a, a Pharisee, and uh, he proclaimed in that conversation with Nicodemus, he proclaimed that God's love was for the whole world. Something completely radical, a bit shaking, if you will, for them. Jesus told Nicodemus and, and others that God's love was for the whole world. It wasn't just for the religious elite and the religious leaders living in Jerusalem. And then last week, if you were with us, um, and if not, that message is on our YouTube page. You can go back and listen. But last week, we watched and uh, kind of the interaction be between Jesus and this Samaritan woman at the well. And what's interesting is that woman at the well represented this world that Jesus was talking about that God loves so much because she was not of the Jewish faith. She was an outsider, if you will. And again today, the story of this father who's hurting for his son, he also represents this world that God loves so much. And, and yet, very much like the woman at the well, 
This man believes that Jesus, this, this man named Jesus, has something to offer him. He can offer healing for his son. I just thought it was so interesting that these two stories tie together. Two foreigners, two outsiders, a, a Samaritan woman in a well and a, and a government official. Both express their faith in Jesus Christ. And yet, they didn't stop there. Because with that expression of faith in Jesus, their lives and the lives of their family, the lives of their friends and the people that they lived with were forever transformed. So I want to invite you, if you've got your Bible, to open your Bible along with me to John chapter 4. Um, if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. They're scattered throughout the seats and the tables here. And um, if you need a new Bible, because maybe yours is uh, a little tattered, torn, or whatever, please feel free to take one. Um, I will be reading, again, verses 43 through 54. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And... <clears throat> Uh, this very first verse, and hold this verse, Josh, it says, at the end of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. And what we need to understand, we didn't read this part of the story uh, with the woman at the well, but after his uh, time with the woman at the well, they invited him, the townspeople, the town wanted him to stay. And so it said that Jesus stayed with them for two days and spoke with them and talked with them and loved with them. And so... This is where we're picking it up. At the end of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. And then in verse 44, it says, He himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. Yet the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything that he did there. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. And when he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son, who was about to die. And Jesus asked, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? By the way, Jesus was not reprimanding. He wasn't rebuking this man here. He was simply kind of lamenting over the people of Galilee, you know, basically saying, are you ever going to get who I really am and what I'm really about? So, verse 49, the official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. And then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. And while the man was on his way, some of the servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. And he asked them when the boy had begun to get better. And they replied, yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. When the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. And then John ends this with these words. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. May God add a blessing to our reading, our hearing, and our understanding of his word. <clears throat> Pretty amazing encounter, right? Pretty amazing story for us to witness kind of unfolding before us in the Bible. This man, this government official, as the New Living Translation said, or your translation might title him a royal official or a nobleman. But hearing that Jesus is in Cana, he comes to him in what I would like to call a, a crisis faith. He comes to him in a crisis of faith, right? His son is suffering this, this really high fever, and he's about to die. This man comes to Jesus because there is no other remedy for his son but Jesus. And so as we just heard, this, this father, this man begs and pleads. That's what the New Living Translation says, that he begged and pleaded for Jesus to travel 
It was 20 miles, 20 miles from Cana to Capernaum. More than likely, this government official, this guy probably had a horse that he rode in on, but, you know, Jesus didn't have a horse, right? But 20 miles, this man is begging Jesus to travel that 20 miles back to Capernaum to heal his son. And I, I just want to say a couple of things. First, it says that this man, man begged and pleaded with Jesus. But if you, if you look at the translation and you, you read it in different translations, the first time he's kind of, uh, please, please Jesus, will you come back with me to Capernaum? But the second time, it's almost as if he is ordering Jesus. He was a government official. He was probably perhaps used to ordering people around and he gets a little more firm. But either way, this man has come to Jesus with a crisis faith, with a faith of in crisis. And, you know, many people come to Jesus that way. Many people, that's, that's how they come to God or to Jesus in prayer, right? There's a crisis in their life. It could be an illness. It could be a job issue. It could be a financial issue. <clears throat> they, they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you've got to fix this. This is what's going on, and I need you to do this. For many of us, that's where we fall in our faith sometimes. We fall into those moments of crisis in our faith. But let's think about this man a little bit, because obviously this man's faith was such that he believed, based on what he'd heard or perhaps he'd seen, but he, he believed that Jesus could heal his son. But only if Jesus would go to Capernaum. You see, his faith in Jesus meant that Jesus needed to go and touch his son before anything could happen. So think about this. This man, who is in crisis because his son is about to die, <clears throat> goes to Jesus and said, you got to heal my son. In his mind, thinking, you got to go with me right now back to Capernaum because unless you touch my son, he's going to die. And Jesus says to this guy, go back home. Your son's going to live. <laughs> can you picture that in your mind? Can, can you imagine if it was your child or your grandchild or someone close to you and you come to your pastor and you go, Pastor, so-and-so's in the hospital and, and they are dying and you've got to come and anoint them and lay hands on them and pray over them. And I go, eh, just go. They're going to be all right. Most of you would probably leave that conversation walking away muttering under your breath, this is not what I paid him for. What kind of pastor is he? But can you imagine, Jesus simply says to this man, go back home, your son will live. And here's where the story gets really fun. Here's where the story gets really cool because at that moment, with those words, Jesus gives this father, this father in crisis, if you will, an opportunity. He's got faith, but Jesus gives him an opportunity to believe at a higher level of faith. In other words, to no longer believe simply on what Jesus could do, but to believe on also who Jesus was. You see, in that moment, that man's crisis of faith grows into a confidence of faith. Look at verse 50 again, if you've got your Bible open. Jesus tells him, go home, your son's going to live. And it says, the man, he, believed what Jesus said. Somehow, those words that Jesus spoke, go home, your son's going to live. Somewhere in that, his crisis of faith became a confident faith, so much so that he had some peace in his heart, and the Bible tells us that he started home. And this is where things get really kind of cool, really exciting, because then it says, the next day, <clears throat> as the man is on his way home, his servants meet up with him. Now again, it's 20 miles. I mean, I don't know the exact train. It wasn't perfectly flat like Michigan, but I can tell you, I have backpacked 20 miles in a day. It's, it's possible, right? 
This is the kind of the interesting thing about the story. This man is on his way home the next day. Scholars believe that because of what we're told, the timeline, that when Jesus said, go home, your son's going to live, that it was late in the day and it probably was getting dark and it was no longer going to be safe for that man to travel those 20 miles from Cana to Capernaum. And so he actually waited until the next day. He had such confidence in his faith in Jesus Christ that he waited overnight knowing that his son was going to live. But So it says on the next day, his servants meet up with him with this glorious news. Your son is living. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that guy is, whether he's walking or traveling by horse, we know he wasn't in a car, so we can scratch that off, but however he's traveling, his mind is only on his son. You can imagine that. <clears throat> he's just wanting to get home. Wanting to get home to see his son. Wanting to get home to see his son. And all of a sudden he sees his servants coming at him. And he's thinking, oh, great. And his servants, can you imagine them? They're shouting and screaming and jumping for joy the minute they see him. Your son is alive. Your son is living. And immediately, what's the man do? He asks what time was it when that happened? Hey guys, check your watch. Did, did anybody take a picture? Did you record it? On? What time did that happen? And he realizes from what his servants tell him that the exact moment that it happened was the precise moment that Jesus said, Go, your son lives. <clears throat> At the exact moment that Jesus told that man in Cana, while they were standing in Cana, Go, your son lives. His son, 20 miles away, the fever left him and he was healed. And once again, this man has this realization and, and suddenly his crisis faith that had become a confident faith now is a confirmed faith because now he not only knows what Jesus could do, he has now heard what Jesus could do and, and that knowledge brings him to the realization of who Jesus truly was. Because only Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, could defy time and distance and heal his son. He realized that Jesus was not just some prophet, not just some medicine man, but Jesus had authority given to him by God over all illnesses. He had power in areas beyond the reach and reason of humankind. He was not limited by time or distance. Remember the story of Jesus turning the, the water into wine? Remember I talked about that if you were here for that message. I talked in that message about how it takes time to make wine. There's the fermentation process, right? It takes a little bit of time. It doesn't happen instantly, but yet Jesus performed a miracle that circumvented that timeline. And here, he performs another miracle that goes beyond distance. Jesus didn't have to be standing in front of that boy touching him to heal him. When the man understood all of this, he came to the realization that Jesus was more than just a man, that Jesus truly was the Messiah, the Son of God, as he had heard other people talk about him. The Bible tells us that when he got home, what did he do? He shared his faith with his family. Again, I can't help but picture that guy. Just, I, I believe he probably, if he was riding a horse, he probably rode that horse to death for the last miles getting home. Man, he was in a hurry. Can you imagine him busting through the door of his house just wanting to see and hold his son? But while he's holding his son who is healed and healthy, he is shouting to his family, I got to tell you about this guy named Jesus. And suddenly this man whose faith went from crisis to confident to confirmed now becomes a contagious faith. Because the Bible tells us that his entire household believed in Jesus. We are a people these days that knows something about 
contagious stuff, don't we? We've lived in this pandemic, and, and we've heard all about it, and, and we know too much about how we can catch viruses, if you will. But can you imagine? We, we've, watched the, we've watched COVID spread. Can you imagine if we all had a contagious faith like this man, how Christianity would spread across this country and this world if we would just move from maybe that, that confident faith or that confirmed faith to that contagious faith? Which brings me to my favorite question, so what? It's a great story, Pastor. Can we just hurry up and get done so we can get to communion and go home and enjoy the rest of our day? What does this story have to do with us? What does this story really mean for you and I? How is this story relevant for our lives? And as I thought about that, um, some of my reading and study really brought me to another part of the Bible where I think it just describes the meaning of the story so perfectly. And, and um, i got to be honest, this kind of came to me in the middle of the morning this morning, so these verses are not going to be on the screen, but I want to share with you. You can write this down and look at them for yourself later. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the, protect, the perfecter of faith. You see, friends, this is what this story is about. This is why Jesus came to reveal faith and to make it grow, to reveal faith in you and I, but not just to, to leave it where it's at. Jesus never wants to leave us in, in a crisis faith or even in a, in a confident faith, you know. Jesus wants to keep moving us and growing us, and so Jesus came to reveal faith and to help it grow. I came across the story as I was preparing this message and I thought it was rather fitting because, you know, we're kind of wrapping up the what I call the real football season. I think there's a game today, but it's not a real game, so I don't, you know, I'm not going to watch it. But next week there's another little football game on, and um, I promise that we will try to get out of here on time for those that want to get to it. But have you ever heard of a guy named Tom Landry? He kind of had a little something to do with the Dallas Cowboys for quite a while. He was coach of the Dallas Cowboys and he once said that the job of a coach is to cause his players to do what they don't want to do so that they can achieve what they really want. The job of a coach is to cause players to do what they don't want to do so they can achieve what they really want. And friends, that's what Jesus in a nutshell, in a way, does for us. You probably already know this, but, but Jesus doesn't always answer our prayers the way we expect or the way we want. Sometimes Jesus, our friend and Savior, allows us to go through circumstances that we don't necessarily want to go through. Sometimes Jesus makes us face things that we just don't like to face. But he does all that in order to bring us to a greater awareness of who he is truly is. Jesus does all that because this, this idea of going from a crisis faith right here to a contagious faith right here isn't a long, it's, it's a lifelong journey, but it's only 12 inches. 12 inches from here to here. This is what Jesus, you know, Jesus wants us to make that 12 inch journey in our faith to bring about greater awareness of who he is so that we achieve what our hearts really want and all along. Jesus makes us face things that we don't necessarily want to face to bring us to a greater awareness of who he is, to achieve what we want in our hearts all along. But to do so, friends, to do so, as I said, it requires that 12-inch that journey in faith, but it requires the strengthening of our faith, or as I titled today's message, 
it, 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 it requires faith and encouragement. And, and friends, that's what the story is all about. This is a story again about an outsider, someone who didn't think they belonged, someone who didn't quite get who Jesus was, having their faith encouraged to the point that they couldn't help but tell others about this amazing Messiah and Savior named Jesus. Every one of us here today, everyone hearing this message has faith in something. May not be in Jesus Christ as your Savior, but all of us have faith in something. And all of us here in this church, our faith sits, sits somewhere in that continuum between crisis and contagious. So my question today is, I'll go back to the words of that song, what's the prison? What's that Sin that's got you entangled that you need your Savior to shake loose for you so that you can experience what this man in the story today experienced so that you can't help but go and tell your friends and family about Jesus Christ. Let's pray about that. God, you know our hearts and you know right where we are right now. And, and I love, God, that there's no condemnation in that. There's no condemnation. You didn't send Jesus to point a finger at us and tell us how bad we are. You sent Jesus to, uh, to coach us, to save us, to, to move us and grow us in our faith. And so, God, you know where we are right now in that faith journey. And if we need to move, if there's places in our lives that we need our faith to grow, shake us right now and help that to happen. God, we are so thankful for the story. The story that's not just about a situation thousands of years ago, but it's a story that speaks into the very situations in our lives today. And, and God, we pray right now that you will grant us the courage and the understanding that when we leave here today with the knowledge of this message, with what we heard from you today, we can go back to those situations with a renewed faith, with a renewed encouragement, with a, a renewed and growing sense that you know what you're doing in our lives and that you are strengthening our faith, you are growing our faith in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to save us. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior and friend. We just pray this in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.